Okay. Welcome to The Man from Missouri. This is the third program featured as part of the Merowith Center's Presidential Legacy Series. In June, we covered Abraham Lincoln, and last month, we discussed Lyndon B. Johnson. Today, we're highlighting Harry S. Truman's legacy with the help of Mark Adams, the Education Director of the Truman Presidential Library and Museum in Independence, Missouri. Mark was born in Liverpool, which you'll figure out as soon as you hear him speak, but he's now an American history expert with more than 30 years of experience, teaching both at the high school and university level. He has been creating and implementing history education and outreach programs for the Truman Library and Museum since 1997 and for the Kansas Museum of History before that. So we're gonna turn everything over to Mark. Welcome. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, for that introduction and thank you for the invitation. It's my pleasure to talk to you this afternoon and you can see the title there on the screen, The Man from Missouri. And of course that very famous sign the book stops here, which we'll talk a little bit more about later on. It's good to start with that because that gives you a sense of Harry Truman's um, personality and his and kind of his motto that he had on his desk in the Oval Office. So let's go ahead and go forward and uh, start the presentation. I just got to get my uh, mouse to work here. Well. Let's see, we've got some different things going on here. There we go, sorry about that. Technology, oh, it's a wonderful thing. Um, we're gonna be looking at a, a variety of um, Truman's decisions, not one more in depth than another. We're gonna cover a number. We can't cover all of the decisions he made as president, but I've highlighted six or seven here that we're gonna be looking at in the next 40 minutes or so. Uh, some might not surprise you, such as the atomic bomb or the Truman Doctrine, but we have there the Marshall Plan, Berlin Blockade, Recognition of Israel, and so on. So we're going to be looking at those as we go through the Truman presidency and kind of what he had to wrestle with, problems that he tried to solve during those seven and three quarter years that he's president. We're going to go a little bit um, backwards in terms of um, context. We're going to move back a little bit to the time that he's vice president, just to give us some background information before we look at the decisions that he had to make. It's important to understand, actually, that um, Truman wasn't necessarily prepared for the presidency and wasn't necessarily informed about everything that was going on. If we go back to the summer of 1944 at the Democratic Convention, Truman is nominated as FDR's running mate, as FDR's running for an unprecedented fourth term. Truman controversially um, does get that vice presidential nomination. And in the November of 1944, in the presidential election, FDR wins that fourth term. Truman is elected vice president. And in January, of course, they go through the inauguration, January of 1945. And you can just tell by this photograph, it's the reason I chose this photograph, just compare their faces and kind of think to yourself about actually the health of the two gentlemen in the photograph. You see Truman on the left, smiling, radiant. They're very close in age, actually. And then you look at FDR and a real contrast in the bags under his eyes and kind of a weathered look. And we all know presidents, whenever they become, when anybody becomes a president, they seem to age very quickly. Barack Obama went gray very fast, his eight years in office and so on. You can see FDR here as he's enter, about to enter his fourth term is aging quickly. And as we know later, he, he is gonna succumb to that and he's gonna die in April of 1945. And so just 82 days after the inauguration in January of 1945, we come to April 12th, 1945, and FDR has passed away that afternoon. And just after seven o'clock in the evening, Truman is sworn in as president. So in those 82 days, the very short vice presidency, Truman and FDR actually only meet privately two times. So it's important to understand the the preparation, 
that Truman has undertaken prior to becoming president, just meets the president twice. He's not part of the inner circle. FDR is well known for his, in his three previous terms, is a very small group of advisors. The vice presidents are not usually part of that. In fact, in February of 45, you know, the month after the inauguration, uh, FDR goes to meet Truman, uh, to meet Stalin and Churchill in Yalta. Truman's not invited. He doesn't get to go. And so he's really out of the loop. So by the time he becomes president, as you can see in this photograph, he's swearing the oath of office on April 12th. He's really, a lot of the things that he's going to face, he doesn't know a lot about. Now he's a senator. He's been a senator from Missouri since 1934. So he's been a senator for 10 years before he becomes vice president. So he's very familiar with Senate relations, congressional relations. He served on very important committees, some that he chaired himself. So from the legislative point of view, he's really up to speed. But the presidential executive branch issues, not so much. And in particular, some of the things that are happening in World War II, as we're going to come to see. Now, just as I should point out, because I'm sure you'll ask the two females in this photograph, it's pretty obvious if you know the Truman family, but uh, that's Bess Truman, they're standing to the left of Harry Truman. And then on the right of the photograph is their one and only child, uh, Margaret Truman. Uh, she's about 20, she's gonna turn 21 uh, in February. This is January. Uh, this is April, so she just turned 21, excuse me. This is April, she just turned 21 in February. She was born in February of 24. And uh, she's living in Washington DC at the time, uh, as is Bess at the time, though she went back and forth to independence a lot. They, they were both, all three of them were in Washington DC that day when they find out about FDR's death. And they rushed very quickly to the White House for Truman to, swear on the Bible and become the president. So it's important to understand that background as he comes to make these momentous decisions, how unprepared he was, and he had to kind of make those decisions anyway, whether he was ready or not. So one of the things I'd like to do during this presentation is from time to time, show you how we reflect some of these things in our new museum exhibits. We just finished a $30 million renovation of our museum. So I thought it would be interesting, in addition to showing you historic photographs and documents, also show you how we're interpreting that within our brand new museum um, that we've just recently reopened. And, and so in this case, we have a spot in the museum where you're actually standing on the spot of April 12th, 1945. So if you were there in our museum today, which is where I am, um, to the left of this exhibit is a photograph very similar to what you've just seen of Truman taking the oath of office. And then we see what faces him from April to May to June, July, and then ultimately in August of 1945. And the things that face him as he takes on his first four, five months of office and some of the decisions that he has to make. Now we know, we have the benefit of hindsight, of course, the big decision that he has to make in August. And that's what you see at the end of the hallway with the atomic bomb. But there are some things in the interim from April, May, June, July, each of those months. So I'm going to show you some documents and photographs to indicate that, but you can see how we've displayed that in our new museum. So in, in April, just two weeks after he takes the oath of office that you just saw, he receives this letter, and I know it may be a little small. I'm going to read it to you because it's pretty short, but he receives this letter from Henry Stimson, who at that time was the Secretary of War. He was Secretary of War under FDR and Truman inherits you know, FDR's cabinet completely. In about 12 months, he's replaced most of them with his own choices, but Henry Stimson is the Secretary of War and he writes to President Truman on April 24th. And he says, dear Mr. President, I think it's very important that I should have a talk with you as soon as possible on a highly secret matter. I mentioned it to you shortly after you took office, but I've not urged it upon you on account of the pressure you have been under. It, however, has such a bearing in our present foreign relations 
and has such an important effect upon all our thinking in this field that I think you ought to know about it without much further delay. And then respectfully yours, Henry Stimson, Secretary of War. And then you see all of these scribbles and handwriting around the side. It's important to notice that. So one of the things that we know here at the library is that Harry Truman's appointment secretary or um, calendar, person who kept his calendar, uh, was his name was Matthew Conley. So actually on this document, it's kind of interesting, has Harry Truman's handwriting. So on the bottom there, he says, Matt, that's Matthew Connolly, put on the list tomorrow, Wednesday 25th, and then that infamous signature, HST. So you can see Harry Truman's signature at the bottom there. So he's telling Matthew Connolly, I wanna see him tomorrow, put him on the list. And then up on the top right corner, just above the first line of the letter, it's scribbled on there. And this is Matthew Connolly's handwriting. Archivists are experts on handwriting, as you know. He says, saw 425-45. So the president saw Henry Stimson about this matter on April 25th, 45. That's important because I think you've probably figured this out, this highly secret matter that relates to foreign relations. Henry Stimson is going to tell Harry Truman all about the Manhattan Project and the work that's going on in New Mexico. And in a sense, it's documentary proof that Harry Truman didn't know anything about the Manhattan Project until 13 days after he becomes president, which is kind of astonishing if you think about it, considering he was vice president for almost three months, but he's completely out of the loop. Uh, and that, you know, this is, Henry Stimson is actually the cabinet member that's kind of the liaison for the Manhattan Project, working with General Groves and Robert Oppenheimer in New Mexico. And so Stimson is relaying all of that information to President Truman. In fact, they flew General Groves in from New Mexico to meet with Stimson and Truman on April 25th to discuss this matter in full detail of where it was at. Now, of course, this is before the very first test so we had not had a successful test yet. They're still working on that. That's gonna come a little bit later in the summer. So this is what Truman, Truman is facing in April. Let's go to May. So in May, just, this is on May 8th specifically, Truman came into office April 12th. So just under a month and has Truman in the Oval Office they didn't have press rooms back then. This is a press conference. Can you imagine a press conference like this today? Secret Service would be probably not very happy with all of the press corps being this close to the president. And you can also tell the lack of um, TV cameras, right? Televisions do exist, but very, you know, this is very much the press and radio um, that are there listening to Truman. And what is he doing? May 8th. 1945, he's announcing German surrender. So this becomes known as VE Day, right? Victory in Europe Day. He's announcing German surrender in World War II. And he's doing this in the Oval Office. And it just ha so happens, it's in another important anniversary in Truman's life. It's his 61st birthday that day. So it's his birthday, it's May 8th, and they're announcing the surrender of Germany. So these events are unfolding, whether Truman has, has literally no control really over German surrender. He's been president just over three weeks. These events are happening anyway. And of course, what that means is, yes, they have to figure out what to do with the defeated Germany and defeated Italy, but also now attention is gonna, of course, shift to Asia where World War II is continuing uh, with Japan. But this shows you these kind of momentous first few months that Truman faces uh, and what now he's facing these decisions, what to do with Germany, what to do with the rest of the war in Asia and so on. We move forward to June. It's really an eventful first few months for him. He doesn't get to do anything in terms of domestic agenda. You know, there's no 100 days for Truman in the sense that he can launch a domestic agenda like many presidents have done. He's dealing with the end of World War II and what to do with the world at peace. So here is Truman 
and he's actually in San Francisco. And this is the creation, it's a historic photograph. It's the creation of the United Nations. Uh, in fact, one of Truman's first decisions in April, when he took the oath of office, his aides came to him and said, are you going to attend this new conference in June in San Francisco about the United Nations that FDR had um, helped create? And Truman agrees, he agrees to go. And this is him speaking at the podium. And it's the closing address of the conference in San Francisco, where they create the United Nations for the very first time. So these events are happening, like I said, whether he likes them or not. And then even more momentous in July, I don't think any of us have, a, have had a summer like this, where all of these events are unfolding. We get to July and now he's in Germany. I think he'd probably prefer to stay in San Francisco, but he's in Germany and he's meeting with Stalin and with Churchill. They are now the new big three, as they like to call themselves in a suburb of Berlin. So Truman gets tours of Germany, tours of Berlin, and sees war-torn Europe. And he gets to meet Stalin for the first time. And he gets to meet Churchill for the first time. Has private meetings with each of them. And then they, of course, have their meetings at the conference, which goes on a couple of weeks, uh, mid-July into the first part of August. Um, he actually sails there, goes by ship, takes him about two weeks to get there. One of the reasons for that is he wants to prepare for the conference. So if he goes by plane, yes, he would get there quicker, but he really feels like he needs to really prepare. And he has some of his aides who were at the Yalta conference in February go with him, like James Burns, and they prepare him, telling him what happened at Yalta and now what expectations um, they might have of decisions to make at Potsdam. In fact, they make Truman the chair of the committee at the Potsdam conference. He's the one that kind of runs the agenda each day. One of the biggest issues they face, um, of course, is what to do with the defeated Germany. And of course, they divide Germany into four segments, four quarters, if you like, with the United States, the British, the Soviet Union, and the French each taking a segment each, and do the same thing in Berlin, which is inside the Soviet zone, they divide Berlin into four segments, and that's gonna come into play in 1948 with the Berlin crisis. But here he is meeting with them. While he's there, while he's in Germany, he gets a telegram and word from Henry Stimson, who's the Secretary of War we mentioned earlier, and there's been a successful test in New Mexico of the atomic bomb. So there's a 14 page report that is sent to Truman via Henry Stimson. And this page that you're looking at is actually the last page of that 14 page report. And it's a sketch from um, a B-29 that was flying about 30,000 feet above New Mexico, about 12 miles away. And they made this sketch of the first successful test. And then the narrative in the prior 13 pages report that's sent to him is very positive and tell, tells Truman how successful the atomic bomb test was and that it's ready for use in the war. And so Truman is ecstatic. He tells Churchill all about it, um, all the details. In fact, he has Truman, he has Churchill read the entire report. Um, what people don't necessarily know is that the Manhattan Project was actually partially funded by the British. So he felt obligated to share that information with the British, but he does not share the information with Stalin, even though they're technically allies still. He does tell him cryptically that we have a new weapon that we can use against Japan, but he doesn't go much further than that. Now with hindsight, we learn much, much later that Stalin actually had spies in New Mexico. And he, is, he may have not found out yet, but very shortly, he's gonna find out about this test from his spies that are in place in Los Alamos. But Truman is unaware of that uh, at the time. I, I love this sketch, I think it's just fascinating. So this is a, this is a photograph of that explosion in New Mexico that they're referring to in the reports. 
and evidence of the successful test. And then very shortly after that, uh, the test is on July the 16th. On July the 25th, orders are given to the United States military to use the weapon. So there's letters sent out, those documents exist. And then the, that's on July 25th. So that's just nine days after the first test, the orders are sent to the military um, authorizing the use of the weapon. So then they have to get it ready, assemble it, get it to Tinian Island, all of these preparations put in place. And then as you well, well already know, on August 6th, they dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima. This is a photograph of that. And then three days later, on August 9th, on Nagasaki. And then shortly after that, of the Japanese surrender on the 15th of August. And then they signed the formal treaties in early September on the USS Missouri. This is of course seen as one of Truman's major decisions. Truman didn't really see it that way. And uh, some historians argue, you know, he should have waited for Japan, you know, for Japan was going to surrender anyway and things like that, or they should have tested it or demonstrated it, I should say on an un uninhabited island, things like that. Truman always says in his memoirs and in his letters, his, he had two main goals, to end the war as quickly as possible and to save as many American lives as possible. And so with this technology, this new weapon at hand, that was what he went forward with. There was a group named the Interim Committee, not a very exciting name and certainly short-lived as hence by its name, the Interim Committee, to give Truman recommendations of what to do with this new weapon. And even though they had some people in there that had some second thoughts or different alternatives about how to demonstrate this or to do a land invasion first and things like that, the committee ultimately recommended to Truman um, to use the bomb against the Japanese without warning. There was a different committee um, to choose the cities that they were to, to, to aim the bombs at. And Nagasaki changed on the day of April, August 9th because of bad weather over the previous city. And so the commander of the mission on that particular one on the second bomb, which was uh, Frederick Ashworth, he made the decision to go to their secondary target, which was Nagasaki because of the bad weather. And even when they got close to Nagasaki, the weather was still poor and they thought they were gonna to have to abandon the mission entirely. But then the clouds lifted and they were able to successfully, from their point of view, successfully drop the second bomb. So in our museum, this is one of the most um, powerful artifacts we have. It's very small and inobtrusive, but it has quite a story behind it. And I think you can just about make it out. It's in a darkened cylinder. This is a green, plug and this was this is the actual sit what we call a safety plug that was inserted into the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki and then right as you're on the mission after they took off from Tinian Island the engineer his name was Philip Bonds took out the live I uh, took out the safety plug excuse me got it flipped around took out this green plug and then armed the bomb with a red activating plug, which essentially uh, activated the circuit, the electric, electronic circuit and activated the bomb. What he did with this green plug, Mr. Barnes, the engineer, he put the green safety plug in his pocket and came home. And then the late 1980s, around 1988, I believe, he came to the Truman Library and he donated it to our curator here at the library and our curator has been here a long time. He's still here and tells this story. And so this is the safety plug that was in the bomb that was dropped on at Nagasaki. And it has the fingerprints of the engineer on it. And it's kind of a remarkable that it survived and is available for the public to view. You might just make out, there's a little tag on the bottom of the display, it's upside down for this photograph, but it's signed by the commander of the mission, Frederick Ashworth, and by the engineer, Philip Barnes, to verify its authenticity. So it's a very powerful object that we use in our museum where we talk about 
the two atomic bonds. So after the two atomic bonds and the Japanese surrender, Truman now has to face decisions in the post-war world. As you see our title of our exhibit in the museum, The Hard Problems of Peace. And I think that's a really effective title. If you think about post-World War II, post-1945, we have peace and everybody's celebrating in Times Square and everywhere and around the world, but now the hard problems emerge. You know, in the United States, GI's coming home. In Europe, the devastation of the Blitz and devastation of Europe and in Asia after the atomic bomb. So you have these hard problems of peace that Truman has to face. And so some of the solutions and some of those decisions that he makes, and this is really where there's a lot of those legacies come through are the Truman's decisions to, he makes to aid other countries after the war. Firstly, in um, March of 1947, with the Truman Doctrine, where he gives aid to Greece and Turkey. Uh, and let's be honest here, primarily to stave off communism. That becomes the new threat once the war is over, is that the Soviet troops have not left, not left Eastern Europe. They've broken their promises. And Greece and Turkey seem to be under threat. Um, the British pull out of Greece. They'd been protecting Greece, just as they're going to pull out of Israel in 1948 and the pulling out of India in Asia. And so there's vacuums, these, these power vacuums around the world. Truman is very concerned about the fall of Greece and Turkey to the Soviet Union and therefore the Soviet Union having access to the Mediterranean and the spread of communism. And so he works with Dean Acheson and as we will see George Marshall, who's the other photograph on this slide about getting aid to Greece and Turkey. And he gets congressional support for that. It's bipartisan legislation, works with the Republican Senator Vandenberg to get $400 million um, passed by May. So this crisis begins in March and by May he's got legislation through Congress to authorize this aid to Greece and Turkey. That really plays into his experience as a Senator and the relations that he has in Congress to be able to get that effectively passed in both houses very quickly. The other element of that probably even more well known is his aid to Europe in particular through the Marshall Plan. And this is George Marshall on the right. Um, it's most well known, it's named after Marshall <laughs> to help it get passed because it's an enormous amount of money. As you can see there, $13 billion and that's in 1947 currency. I haven't extrapolated what that would be in 2022. And that goes to 16 countries in mostly Western Europe. It's offered to the Eastern European countries and to the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union doesn't allow it. They call it economic imperialism, that you know, Truman wants to affect the politics of those countries in Eastern Europe by providing aid. So it's rejected in Eastern Europe. And they, in fact, the Soviet Union set up kind of the counterpart to that. But those two decisions really play into Truman's legacy in many ways, because it really helps rebuild Europe. And it's really an unusual step for the, a lot of this money is going to defeated enemies, Germany, Italy, and others. Uh, that, that's, not, that's not what happened after World War I, as we well know. So it's a really different track that he takes. And, but again, that criticism is the, of uh, is this economic imperialism. But as we know now that phrase Marshall Plan, we now hear phrases like Marshall Plan for the environment, Marshall Plan for Africa, Marshall Plan for this, Marshall Plan for that. So it has kind of a life of its own in terms of its legacy and in, in fact, how beneficial it was in rebuilding relationships with European countries towards the United States. So really uh, effective decision-making and Truman was humble enough not to have it named after himself. Um, and there's political reasons for that too. It was easier for passage through Congress with Marshall's name on it. We move forward to 1948 and there's a whole plethora of decisions that Truman has to make. 
And as a reminder, although we're not going to necessarily talk about it today, this is also an election year. That previous election, when Truman was elected as vice president, was in 1944. So 1948 is an election year. Of course, that's not going to be until November. He's got lots and lots of decisions to make in 1948, earlier in the year. I've just listed three of them there that we're going to talk about, and that is the recognition of Israel, the desegregation of the military, and the Berlin blockade during the Berlin crisis. Recognition of, recognition of Israel there is featured with a photograph on the left, which is Harry Truman with Heim Weizmann. Um, this is quite a controversial decision um, in that it's one of the few decisions, actually, that Truman faces where some of his own cabinet members actually disagree with him. And the State Department uh, um, primarily are really against Truman recognizing Israel. Um, they're, they're feeling that the United States should let the United Nations handle it to support partition. Um, Truman's um, business friend and friend from World War I, as you might remember, Truman was a, a captain in World War I, the only president to see combat in World War I. His friend from World War I, Eddie Jacobson, who was Jewish, um, introduced him to Heim Weizmann, and Heim Weizmann had secret meetings with him in the White House and convinced Truman that he should recognize Israel uh, once Israel declared itself independent. The British had pulled out, as you know, and the United Nations put forward a partition plan. But by the spring of 1948, uh, Israel rec um, declares itself independent after the British mandate ended. And astonishingly, uh, Truman recognizes Israel 11 minutes after the announcement is made in Israel of this new independent country. 11 minutes, and I'll show you the document here in a second. It's an astonishingly quick um, turnaround. He had the decision ready to go. They'd had a big showdown meeting in the Oval Office two days before. And George Marshall, who we just mentioned, was really adamantly opposed to Truman, which is really quite shocking. If you know anything about the two men, very close friends. Truman once described George Marshall as the greatest living American, but he was really opposed to it. Truman was able to win him over eventually. Um, so to, to recognize Israel that very quickly um, was really a fascinating uh, discussion and, and decision to make. Uh, let's look at that. Well, we're gonna get, we're gonna, I'm gonna go forward and go back. I wanna show you this document. Um, this is cropped a little bit. I apologize for that. I wanted to fit it on the screen. This is the official statement that Truman puts out. And again, I love the documents that have Harry Truman's own handwriting on them. And so he inserts some language here. Uh, and so you see in the first paragraph, um, the government has been informed that a Jewish state has been proclaimed in Palestine and recognition has been requested by the, and he inserts, provisional government thereof. They haven't had any elections. Elections don't come until January of 1949. And this is May 14th, 48. And then the United States recognizes the provisional government as the de facto authority of the, and then he scratches out the newest Jewish state and he inserts the state of Israel. They weren't actually sure what the name of the country was going to be until it was announced which is kind of fascinating. And then you see Harry Truman's signature, and then it's cut off a little bit, but it says approved May 14th, 1948. What's also cut off, he puts the time 6-11, which of course in, uh, that's in Washington DC time. So just 11 minutes uh, after recognition had been, um, independence had been announced in, in uh, Israel. So a fascinating document. Let's just go back. And so there you see Heim Weizmann there. The other photograph you see up on the top right is, a, is from the Berlin Airlift. We're gonna to come to that. We're gonna switch though to civil rights. It's kind of like the president, you gotta juggle all of these decisions all at the same time, because these are all going on at the same time. It's, it's, people think that presidents you know, deal with one issue at a time. You look at his appointment calendar, which we have online, it's kind of astonishing. He's dealing with all of these things at once. This one is, regard, is related to civil rights. This is actually from 1947, but it gives you an indication. It's a very historic photograph because Truman is addressing the NAACP, the National Association for Colored People. And Truman is the very first president 
to address that group. And he does so in 1947. And then in 1948, in February, he addresses the um, joint session of Congress as he puts forward his uh, integration policies and his civil rights plank, which Congress primarily turns down. Certainly the Republicans are against him, but actually Southern Democrats uh, vote against him as well. So we can't get things through, um, through legislation to help advance his civil rights um, policies. So we're gonna come back again. Well, I don't have it, I thought I did. Let's go back to that. So what he does instead, I apologize. What he does instead is he issues executive orders. He has executive power to do that from the executive branch, particularly over the military and federal government. And so what he does in the summer of 1948 is he issues two different executive orders. One is to do with the military and it's probably more well-known than the second one. And that is to integrate the military. It's executive order 9981. And you can find that document online on our website. And that calls for the integration of US troops going forward in all branches of the military. Very controversial, and it takes a while for that integration to go forward, but it, it does. By 1953 and the end of the Korean War, 98% of the military in all branches are integrated rather than being segregated. People are quite surprised to realize that during World War II, even though we're fighting against the Nazis and their racist policies, we do that, we fight that war with segregated troops. So it's not until 1948 and Truman's executive order and he makes that decision. Some of the other things of 1948, I've mentioned Israel already, and that's one of the videos that we have in our gallery on the left photograph. On the right is another photograph from our galleries, which deals with the Berlin blockade. Uh, and so Stalin had surrounded um, West Berlin inside the Soviet zone, but West Berlin was controlled by the British, the French, and the United States. And it leads to the Berlin airlift, which lasts about 15 months, where pilots from a number of countries uh, fly in supplies, they land, they unload the planes in 30 minutes, and it's around the clock, 24 hours a day mission. Originally, that was a temporary decision recommended by the military. And Truman says, we're his phrase is, we stay in Berlin, period. And he does not want to give up Berlin to Stalin. And eventually Stalin relents. I would argue this decision and this crisis actually helps Truman in the 1948 election because they see him standing up to Stalin and protecting West Berlin. And so by 1949, long time after the election is over, Stalin backs down and West Berlin is protected. And in fact, after that in 1949, West Germany is created and East Germany is created. And of course, they're divided until the 1990s. The Berlin Wall doesn't come until the 1960s. So people get confused with that. But Berlin is separated, just not by a wall, just different countries overseeing them. The three allies, the British, the French, and the Americans, merged together to form um, West Germany in 1949. And there's some displays there that you can see in our exhibits. And this is the Israel document. We're gonna move on. Truman, spoiler alert, Truman does win the 1948 election. People in St. Louis are very aware of that because that's where that very famous Dewey defeats Truman newspaper was taken in St. Louis and St. Louis Post-Dispatch has the copyright to that famous photograph, actually. Um, uh, but that takes place in St. Louis when Truman is heading back from Independence to Washington, D.C. on the train and holds up that newspaper. Dewey defeats Truman. So Truman wins that election. We go into the second term. He's thinking now he can handle his domestic agenda. And it's pushed aside by two events, the Red Scur and McCarthyism and the Korean War. And as we're talking more about Truman's decisions, I thought we'd focus on the Korean War. Truman was actually in independence, uh, in, his, in his home in independence, when he gets word from Dean Acheson from Washington, D.C., his secretary of state at the time, that North Korea has invaded 
South Korea. And he immediately gets ready to fly back to Washington, D.C., which, if I remember correctly, I think he does via St. Louis as well. He gets a train, gets a plane to St. Louis and then from St. Louis to Washington, D.C. to get back as quickly as possible. He engages the help of the United Nations rather than Congress. He does not go for a declaration of war through Congress, but in fact, um, encourages the United Nations to put together a coalition of forces. Uh, at the time, the Soviet Union is actually boycotting the United Nations. And so they're able to get that passed without the Soviet Union veto. And the United Nations forces are committed into the Korean War. And then you see a very famous gentleman next to Truman in that photograph, which is Douglas MacArthur. We're going to come to him, I think, on the next slide. Here you can see the 38th parallel, which is where North and South Korea have been divided. At the Potsdam Conference, incidentally, is where they drew that line between North and South Korea. And then you see some of the troops that are fighting. And this, is, this actually accelerates the integration of the military. The actual conflict actually accelerates that integration through the war. And then this is the, most people know the Korean War because of the controversial incident where Truman actually fires General MacArthur for insubordination and he is replaced by Matthew Ridgway. We can go into that if, with questions later if you would like, but he uses his executive power of chief executive and commander in chief to remove MacArthur for insubordination. And then here's how we displayed some of the material on our museum. You can see in the background, I've got two photographs here. In the background, you see the, um, the map of Korea, North and South, and the red is the North Korean troops and the gray is the United Nations troops. And you see on the second image, how the North Korean troops push the United Nations troops all the way down to the Busan perimeter. And then on the third map, the United Nations troops push all the way back to the Chinese border. But then as we know, then the Chinese troops come in and push back again. And then we see on the photograph, the map on the far right, we end up with a stalemate on the 38th parallel, which is a existence today. There's never been a peace treaty. We're still in a ceasefire armistice. There's never been uh, an end to, the, to that war. And then in the bottom is some of the other exhibits that we have five uniforms on display some of the winter materials, because it was a very cold time in Korea, nurses uniform, a women's Air Force uniform. And interestingly on the right, the all blue uniform is actually a uniform of, from a prisoner of war, um, a North Korean who was held prisoner of war by the United Nations. And then just to kind of talk about um, Truman's legacy in the sense of how we display that, it's the same photo I have behind me or at least similar uh, Truman's Oval Office, which has been reproduced in our museum based on a 1950 series of photographs. So it's incredibly accurate. During the 19, early 1950s, the White House went under an extensive renovation. And so the National Park Service took extensive photographs of the entire White House. And so we're able to build our replica Oval Office based off of those photographs. So you can see some of the family photographs behind the chair. I believe our curator told me there's 13 ashtrays on the desk. I haven't counted them lately. Uh, I just have to believe him. On the right of that photograph is the very first television set that was in the Oval Office. Truman bought a television for $100 in 1948. Uh, and so that's, that's that, you know, with school students, it's quite funny. This little box over here with this kind of oval screen, they have no idea what that is, but it's a television set. Doesn't look like they're flat screens at home or even their iPads or phones that they watch the TV on. And then you see um, FDR and the portrait on the left. On the other side of the room, we don't have a photograph for you to see today, but you can believe me. Above the fireplace, he has a portrait of George Washington. It's interesting with the Biden administration very shortly after his inauguration, uh, amongst you know a lot of news stories about him having busts of Martin Luther King and Cesar Chavez. The small print of those news stories, President Biden has a bust of Harry Truman 
uh, in his Oval Office. So we're proud of that at the Truman Library. And um, so let's move forward. And so we do a lot of educational programs to teach students about the Truman legacy, the decisions that he made, the far reaching effects of containment, the Marshall Plan, the Truman Doctrine, the Berlin Blockade, and also his domestic agenda too, through civil rights and his pushes for Medicare and so forth. And so this is a group of third graders who attend the same school as Bess Truman, uh, Bess Wallace Truman, the first lady in independence, Bryan Elementary. Um, and they're studying here the three branches of government by coming into the replica Oval Office. You can make out the globe there on the left. That was a gift from Dwight Eisenhower to Harry Truman. And just see the very bottom of the frame of the portrait of George Washington. I'm teasing you there, but that's what's behind the clock above the fireplace there, there in that uh, photograph. And then outside in our courtyard, President Truman and the First Lady, Bess Wallace Truman, are buried out in our courtyard for visitors to come visit them. And then in the background where you see those kind of two white lines and a glass window, that's actually Truman's office. He worked here in the building for about 15 years. The library opened in 1957. Truman privately fundraised all of that money to get the library built. And then he passed away in 1972 and he came here every day to work. And so visitors can see the office that he worked in when he came to independence every day. And this is one of my favorite photographs because this is what we try to do. We try to inspire awe and wonder in students. And I think we did that with one little blonde boy right there. So I'm gonna stop the screen sharing and now you get another angle of the, uh, the Oval Office and we should come back on the camera. There we go. So we left about 11 minutes for questions. So that seems like good timing. So if you wanna use the chat or if you wanna unmute or however you'd like to uh, engage and ask questions, be glad to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Mark. Really appreciate that. It's a great presentation. Thank Looks you. Like we, already, we already have a question. So let me uh, go ahead. Hewlett? No, it's, no, it's Marilyn. Marilyn? Okay. I just want to thank you so much. It was just like a complete history lesson. <laughs> well, it really was. It was just fabulous. But I have Dave, briefly David McCullough's book, which uh, Truman, which took him 10 years to write. Yes. And the thing that he mentioned, which I thought what goes around comes around, that when Nixon was a junior senator, he wanted Truman impeached because of when he fired MacArthur. But yet, at Truman's funeral, he praised Truman. So, I mean, you know, and, and it, David McCullough talked about how agonizing it was for Truman before he came to this decision to fire MacArthur. I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. Uh, and I think a lot, I think the piece that's missed a lot of the time, and we try to really reflect it in our exhibits, is he does wrestle with this decision, but what he does do is he goes to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and talks to them and says, you know, not so much I want you to tell me what decision to make, but like, what, what's your advice? And they were very concerned, ultimately about the Constitution, ultimately about the role of the Commander in Chief, and you have somebody active at the war front in Korea, uh, actively disobeying orders, having his representatives make inflammatory speeches on the floor of Congress, which is what he did, and his supporters uh, actively writing letters, congressmen writing letters to be published in the New York Times, um, opposing Truman's policy using MacArthur's words. So it was, you know, it was blatant insubordination, but it's one of those decisions, and we know this, at the time, you know, the shock, the horror, there's political cartoons of, you know, Truman should be impeached. But then as the, as the information comes out and as the evidence comes out over the years, 10, 20, 30 years or so, and the documents are released, there's very few people today that said Truman got that wrong. At the time, it was, <laughs> his popularity went way down into the 20s yeah. at the time, but you're right, but much later, 
um, it was a very different uh, evaluation of that. The, the, tr the Nixon praising Truman is interesting because he does come to see Truman. We've got photographs of him. And I can't remember the exact date. It's like 1970, 71, something like that. And he comes to visit him and smiles and handshakes. But Truman was, was really getting up there and his health wasn't great. So it wasn't like he was going to criticize Nixon at the time in the, in the early 70s. But um, I guess Nixon got what was coming to him eventually. I'm not right. sure if that's a polite thing to say. But I will, I was, Laura and I were talking about this. One of the things that increases Truman's popularity is actually um, the Nixon crisis. Uh, after Nixon resigns, the American public starts to look back in hindsight of, well, we need a president that's more honest. We need a president that has a better character. And Truman becomes kind of a, a flag bearer for that. And he had just passed away in 1972. So there's a lot of legacy involved in that. So in a way, Nixon's death, or Nixon's resignation, excuse me, um, really increased Truman's popularity, along with, in the 90s, David McCullough's book as well, mm -hmm. which, as you know, David McCullough just had his funeral this week in right. Martha's Vineyard. Our, our director here at the library uh, was at the funeral in Martha's Vineyard, and it has a very close connection. The Truman Library dedicates that Truman book uh, to, a couple, to at least two of our archivists here in the building because um, he did, re he, as you said, he researched that book here for about 10 years. Hey, Mark, Fran Thank has you. a question, and then um, Vicky yeah. does. So, Fran, go ahead. Hey, uh, first of all, it's, you bring it a lot. We, we were just there two weeks ago. We went in preparation. So I want to confirm a few things. What, I think it said that his was the first library under the Presidential Library Act. That's true. It gets a little tricky with these firsts. I always get uncomfortable with firsts. Um, but yeah, the presidential, there were, so there were presidential libraries prior to that, but it was the first uh, federally authorized through the Presidential Libraries Act, yes. Okay, thank you. And then the other thing I remember reading, which kind of blew me away was, was it his grandmother that was very prejudiced and upset with him? Yes, very much so. He, he has very Southern roots. Um, his uh, grandparents owned slaves on both sides. Um, she was very upset with him when he joined the National Guard in the early 1900s. He came, I think it was 03 or 04, came home in a blue uniform. And she said, don't, don't ever wear that blue uniform in my house ever again. Things like that. So his... <laughs> He, he came from very Southern roots and he kind of almost had to overcome that. There's been books about that, about his kind of transformation from that background to his civil rights policies when he's president. So it's a very fascinating thing to look at, uh, his background compared to his actions as president. Thank you. Great okay, questions. Vicky, Thank yeah. you. Vicki, you have a question? Actually, I want to share a memory. I'd like to speak to give him hell, Harry, <laughs> as I knew him growing up in Kansas City. And after he retired from being president, we would watch him on the six o'clock news taking what he called his constitutional <laughs> around independence. I don't remember seeing Secret Service following him, however. I guess there were some there. I really don't know. But uh, I also was there when the erroneous newspaper came out declaring to Dewey as the winner. And then when that was reversed, my family and I cheered. And I, I have those fond memories of Harry Truman. Those are great memories. Now, I will say that although he didn't necessarily have Secret Service, he had um, retired Independence Police Department um, took care of him, but they often had a hard time keeping up with him when he was walking because he had that military pace, 120 steps. And so they did have a hard time. Now his security detail did increase uh, after 1963, after the Kennedy assassination. So from about 53 to 63, it was quite light. Mm -hmm. but then, then after the Kennedy assassination, uh, his security detail was stepped up. Thank you. 
You're very welcome. That's great memories. Thank you for sharing those. You have a question now from Myra. Myra, yeah. go ahead. Yes. Um, I enjoyed seeing Harry Truman's signature and some of his writings. Uh, I'm an amateur graphoanalysis, and I would say one of his most dominant traits was perseverance. You can see that in both his signature with the uh, HST and also Harry Truman. Uh, the pen never leaves the paper. It's all connected, which is a sign of perseverance. Um, he had, has um, a keen mind and analytical ability. And there was one D where he came down the stem very strong and that was showing uh, the ability of being very, um, having strong perseverance. So uh, also in his signature was um, intuition and caution. Very interesting. We do a, we do a theme tour for students elementary students on character and how character informed his actions and decisions. So I'm going to look into that to see because perseverance certainly comes up with the students and it's a great lesson for them to think about perseverance, right? We don't want them giving up after the first attempt. Perseverance also comes through in his personal relations because Bess Wallace keeps turning him down <laughs> and she, she, he eventually gets her to relent and to agree to marry him. So perseverance comes through there too, not just as president and his decisions, but also in his personal relations as well. So that's fascinating. Thank you. So Mark, you have um, a direct message from um, Jerry who wanted to say thank you for an excellent presentation. And uh, I also wanted to share my personal story. Mark's already heard this, but when I was a little girl in the summer of 1962, my grandmother, Edith Bryant, took me to Jefferson City with my brother. And as we're walking along the streets, all of a sudden, I heard my grandmother say, good morning, Mr. President. And there he was, President Truman. So that's my connection to President Truman. And it's a pretty wonderful memory. Yeah, that's a great story. If, if I can, this is Marilyn Pittler. Yeah. I have a memory. I was sure. about five years old. My family took me to Washington, D.C. with my older sister. It was the 4th of July. And... We're in a big park area, I forgot where, watching fireworks. There was a woman sitting next to me, keeping my attention until it got dark enough for the fireworks. And we were catching fireflies and President Truman spoke. Huh? Oh, wow. And I was there, I was five years old. Fireworks is one of the reasons Truman ended up wearing glasses because as a young child, he was at a fireworks display. Not really sure where it was, whether it was in Independence or Kansas City. But he, mm. he, he, no, he told his mother that he didn't really think he could see the display very well. It seemed blurry to him. And so that was the mm. first time she took him to go get his vision checked in Kansas City. He took him very young age because by first grade he was wearing glasses and got him checked. And uh, that's why he wore glasses the rest of his life. Um, as of that, because of that fireworks display. I'm sure they would have discovered it eventually, but <laughs> it, it took a fireworks display so to, for the family to recognize that he really did have quite a deficiency in his eyes. Uh, mm. so, so as you see, most of the photographs you see of him, he's always wearing his glasses. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, Mark, thank you on behalf of all of us. We really appreciate your time and your expertise. It's been a wonderful program. Well, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the great questions. And it's my pleasure. It was a wonderful, informative uh, discussion. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you. I think you've got the best background today that I'm just admiring <laughs> those flowers. I was a little distracted watching those flowers because I, <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have a butterfly garden in my own backyard. So I was kind of going, wow, this I, I'm going to have to do some yard work this weekend. It's nothing close to that. <laughs> we, have, we have no grass. Only... Native, dedicated native plant people. Amazing. That's incredible. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.